Yeah, I think first and foremost, the responsibility of a documentary filmmaker is to um, tell something compelling, tell a compelling story. This is A New Angle, and I'm your host, Justin Angle, marketing professor at the University of Montana. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of Montana. We are proudly underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications. Okay, folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in this week. I am stoked to bring you my conversation with Eric Becker, the writer and director of the documentary film Return to Mount Kennedy. Eric and I go way back to our time living in Seattle and racing bikes together. It's been great to watch his film career progress and watch success follow that progression. And I was able to grab some of his time during his recent visit to Missoula for the Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. Return to Mount Kennedy is amazing, and I'm excited for you to learn all about it right now. All right, so we're here with Eric Becker. Eric, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, Justin, thanks for having me. You're sipping that drum coffee. How's it going I, I down? Am, I'm definitely sipping this drum coffee. A little hot right now. A little hot, straight off the yeah. uh, the pour over clever dripper that John set us up with. I think it's the Peru blend. You know, I was going to say that. It tasted like <laughs> it tastes Peru. like Peru. Yeah, it totally had a Peru taste to it. You've got a very discerning palate. No, you don't even know, man. <laughs> well, that's appropriate. Eric and I, uh, we go way back. We met in Seattle. Um, as buddies on uh, the Fair Start cycling team. Actually, Thumbprint Racing was, was our, was I think, the name of our team, and then Fair Start was the sponsor. Yeah, yeah, there might have been some rebranding in the middle there at some point. Yeah, there's a lot of stories to tell there. So many. But anyway, um, you're, I, I feel like we've known each other a long time, but every time I spend time with you, I learn so much more about all the layers to your life, you know, how gifted a photographer you are, and then now your your filmmaking business is thriving, and you have this movie. You're here in town for the Big Sky uh, Documentary Film Fest. Your movie, Return to Mount Kennedy, showed last night. It's phenomenal. I want to talk all about that, but um, let's just set up the 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 listener with a little bit of background of how on earth do you become a filmmaker? Like that seems like one of those jobs that people might want to do it, but I have no idea how to get there. Yeah, and I think that was the case with me. I had no idea how to do it when I was um, when I was young, and then um, took a totally different path. I think to to figuring out how to make it work um, in a way that I could create good work and that I could survive and actually pay my rent and eat. Um, I started out uh, really thinking I was going to be a doctor. Okay. So this uh, is like undergrad, you were Hampshire College. Yeah, or actually something? even back to back to fourth grade. Really? Okay. Yeah. Fourth grade, my dad um had a lot of like heart issues. Mm. And so he started studying just like cardiovascular um physiology, just to like learn about so he's not a physician. Just... No, not at all. He's just he's like a guy who never finished college, but he's super self taught and yeah. um, knows everything about electronics and does a lot of stuff with uh, wireless internet technology. He's kind of a little like an entrepreneur. He's he's seventy eight, gonna turn seventy nine this year and he's doing a startup. Wow. Um so very, you know, autodidact, self taught guy and was having a lot of health issues and then just started um, researching about it. That's actually how I got into riding bikes too, is because he needed to lose a bunch of weight and realized cycling was probably the it's easiest way, way to do it. Do it. Yeah. yeah, he was in his 40s, he's a little older. So uh, I would learn a lot about physiology with him, about how the body worked. I was really interested in it. I think he pushed me in that direction. He liked the idea of having a, a physician, uh-huh. I think, uh, as a child, as a, you know, whatever, as I like grew older. Um, he came from a very for- poor family, so I think like you get with a lot of people that come from poorer backgrounds, like they want their children to have professional jobs. At, sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I thought from a young age that I would go into medicine and I actually went to a special uh, health focused high school. It was called Northside Health Careers High School in San Antonio, Texas. It was in the medical center in uh, in San Antonio. And we did a lot of like laboratory sciences and learned how to draw blood and would be able to shadow doctors and work in hospitals. And it was very science focused. And so I was very much driven and pushed to be in the sciences. And there was no like thought that creativity could be a job that I could have. Sure. So yeah, even though I'm not on the menu. Yeah. Even though I always had this kind of creative drive and really loved to make stuff, um, always wanted to be a writer, it just kind of wasn't, just wasn't really on the table. Mm-hmm. Um, went to college and studied public health. Quite far from Texas, right? Yes. Western Massachusetts. Yeah, Western Mass. Went to a place called Hampshire College. And that place is very, um, you know, you got to be self-directed. It's it's um, 
project based. There's no grades, no majors. You kind of do it yourself. Very kind of hippy dippy. Super hippy liberal dippy. arts. Yeah, way out there. Yeah, if you want to study bong rips, you can study <laughs> bong rips. That's a major. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you mean, choose you your could, own major. Yeah, no you majors. could do it. You could do your major in yeah. bong rips. No problem. Okay. So um, I had all these friends there that were that were doing filmmaking and you know creative pursuits, and like I would go to their screenings and sit there in the audience, just like just so overwhelmed with the stuff that they were making and yeah. i'm sure none of it was that good but you know i was 20 years old and i'm watching these films that people are making and was just thinking it was the coolest thing in the world mm-hmm. and at the time i was studying public health i was working as an emt i was an emt for three years so i was still very much in the um kind of medical kind of you know field like heading towards doing yeah you're on that best. path yeah absolutely after college i did a lot of work in uh actually during college um and after i did a lot of work in Nicaragua and these kind of smaller communities in really rural areas and was working on health system stuff with Mm -hmm. a bunch of different doctors doing kind of public health programs and then ended up deciding that I wanted to shoot a documentary about the work that they were doing down there. So my buddy Henry, who was someone I went to college with, convinced me that he would be a good person to hire to take down there to like shoot this film. Sure. And we had no clue what we were doing. You know, I wrote out all these kind of like scripts and like storyboard ideas of what we would shoot and then probably didn't shoot any of that stuff. All the footage is garbage because we had no idea how to use the cameras, right? And had this really important failure at that point Uh in my career where I learned how to not make a documentary film, basically. I love that term, important failure. Yeah, and cheap cheap failure too. Sure, yeah. Fail cheap, fail fast. It's kind of a key tenet of entrepreneurship these days. Yeah, Wait, can I cuss on this podcast? Absolutely, let it rip. Yeah, Yeah, this is the term that I use that is just fuck upward, right? Like. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so anyway, I definitely fucked upward with that one. Uh, At the time that we were shooting all that stuff, I, I had applied to grad school at Yale to do public health, to do a master's in public health. Okay. Um, and then got accepted to Yale and ended up going there for I two years. I knew you studied at Yale. I thought you studied film at Yale. No. You studied public health. I studied public health. Yeah, I have, a, I have a master's in public health. And, and maybe when we intersected in Seattle, you were working kind of in public health, but also had the film yeah. thing on the side. And yep. it just was your, your kind of a, a different stage of your development. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so... You know, th- there were these kind of two threads of me doing the public health work yeah. and me caring a lot about, you know, issues of human rights mm-hmm. and a civil society and health and, um, you know, just wanting to do something good, right? Like yeah. wanting to be a positive force for change in the world. And um, w- one of the main reasons I went to Yale is because they gave me student loan money. And with that student loan money, I could buy a laptop to edit all this footage that I had shot oh, okay. in Nicaragua. Yeah. Um, so I ended up buying a nice laptop and kind of learning how the editing software worked. Never made a film out of any of this stuff. It's all just kind of sitting in a box on DV tape somewhere. But it still got me to start to learn the program that you mm-hmm. need to know to like cut the footage together. At the time, that was Final Cut Pro. Right. So uh, did grad school and after grad school, well, raced bikes in grad school, really. Yeah. That was my main thing. Majored in the, bicycle yeah, racing? totally majored in bicycle racing. Yeah, I'm familiar racing. with that concept. Yeah, I think you know how that goes. Um, was super obsessed with cycling and ended up doing an internship at the World Health Organization just so I could be in Europe, so I could ride my bike all summer <laughs> in the Alps. And that's what I would do. I would, like, go into this internship, you know, like, probably nine to three or something during most days of the week. And they didn't care that I was there and I didn't know what I was doing. It was just yeah. like, you know, I was in this giant bureaucracy. Um, met really cool people though, um, and then spent my time riding my bike in the hills and watching the Tour de France when it came through. But um, I did meet one one guy who was working like in the communications department, and he had a bunch of magazines that were really interesting issues in global health, but they were visually communicated in a way okay. that I thought was super compelling. Yeah. And when I saw that stuff, I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. I want to figure out a way to bring this kind of creative drive that I've always had to issues of public health. So uh, from there, I had a little bit of a, like, I don't know, quarter life crisis. That assumes I would, I would be pretty old, I guess. So I don't know. Who knows? Quarter life? Yeah. 25? I'll, I'll let you know after I'm dead. I'll do the yeah, math after I'm yeah, dead. Yeah, it's hard to kind of forecast yeah. that, I guess. So uh, had a little had a little bit of a crisis. Didn't really like any of the jobs that I potentially could have in public health because mm-hmm. they were, you know, epidemiology and... I'm not good at math, even though I've had to struggle with it the entire time. It just, it wasn't stuff I was going to get hired to do. So I felt sort of unemployed and kind of like the graduate 
headed back to my parents' house in Texas, did some work with my dad for a while with his company, and um, and then was at the same time like teaching myself how to develop websites just because I wanted to learn how do you get content on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that, started learning more about photography and other ways of visual communication. And then a buddy uh, called me up from L.A. and said, hey, man, I just started working on this HBO show. We need like an intern um, and I need a roommate. Do you want to come out to L.A.? OK. And, you know, I'm at my parents' house. I'm 27 years old or something. I'm like, Seems like a yes. Mm, yeah, it's a pretty emphatic yes. I don't think he even got it all out of his mouth first. So. <laughs> Um, so I headed to LA and I ended up working this HBO show. Originally, you know, they were like, yeah, we just need an unpaid intern. And I was like, fine, great. I'll make it work. Like I was looking for temp jobs, uh, just whatever I could do. But mm-hmm. before I even got there, they said, Hey, we got, you know, 400 bucks a week for you. So I made it work on 400 bucks a week and ended up working this HBO show. And from that, I learned how to produce. So it was a very small team of people working on it. So how do you take something from like just an idea and move it all through the production process to where right. you get a final thing, mm-hmm. which uh, I think is the most important skill set that you have to have as a documentary filmmaker. And that's knowing how to just shepherd that thing through and know every step of the process to right. make it successful and make it good and watchable and, and all those things too. So, yeah. And, and is that... Um... I mean, I'm sure like you, you learned that approach of production through that HBO experience and other experiences. And then over time, you probably have honed your own craft, your own version of that process to do the work in the way you want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I whenever I like talk at, at college programs or whatever, the thing I try to instill in people that want to be filmmakers or photographers is that there's no way around the work. It's just any like anything, any athletic yeah, pursuit. Yeah. Like that. I mean, that's a big theme of this podcast is you know so many guests we've had on that have had success in, in a wide variety of fields have said you got to do the work. Yeah, you just got to pay your dues, do the time, grind, grind it out. No shortcuts. Yeah, I mean that's that's Absolutely. kind of a, an emergent truth of of many things that you know, in my own experience, but also talking to so many folks like you that have had success in whatever the field is. Yeah. And, you know, it's like the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. Yeah. Thing. That's Malcolm Gladwell, right? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, he's the one that sort of popularized yeah. it in his, in come his up books. With it, yeah. um, and then the research underlying it is kind of mixed, but... Sure. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, the 10,000 Ar- Arbitrary rule. number as it is. Experience yeah. counts. Yeah. But when we break that down, what that means is like, if you're going to get that many hours in, you need to orient your life to the thing that you're doing. Right. And so I find a lot of people that are kind of like part-time filmmakers or part-time actors or part-time writers, whatever, like it's hard to just hit that quotient that you need to, to be good at the craft, Mm -hmm. right? You need to be doing it full time. So, um, after LA, I lived there for a couple of years, worked on a couple of different shows and still like didn't love Hollywood as a place because yeah. I still had that mission-driven kind of goal with my work. Like mm-hmm. I want to do something more, you know, I just like didn't feel great about working on working on Hollywood stuff. So I yeah. uh, had the opportunity to move to Seattle and then ended up connecting with people within the global health community and getting into the sort of nonprofit world, making films, doing visual communication, helping with websites for nonprofits in Seattle. And that's probably about the time. Yeah, that's probably when our paths intersected. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, the time you were, you were sort of like working on some documentary stuff, but also sort of doing the hustle of, you know, working on ads or short films or whatever for different brands in the outdoor industry and beyond, probably trying to put together a portfolio that would enable you to do the larger work that you were trying to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I didn't know what I wanted that larger work to be. Sometimes I still don't know. So in general, I I would just do the things that I felt were interesting and that would help me practice and evolve the craft. And then I really put the focus on learning every last bit of it. The industry of being a filmmaker in the last 10 years has radically changed. It's not like it was... 20 years ago when only a certain subset of people could really make commercial, professional, good-looking stuff. Yeah, yeah. The barriers to entry are way low, but probably the financial rewards are also much more complicated. Sure, yeah, complicated is a good way to say say non-existent. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) No, they're there. I mean, the, the thing is the market's really moved to the middle where people that originally were spending $100,000 on a video, now want to spend $20,000 right. on that video. But people that maybe would have spent $1,000 can realize that if they spend another $4,000, they can get something way better. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like 
it's gone up from the bottom and sort of down from the top in a weird way. Um, but the tools are a lot way more readily available, so they're cheaper, and then the education is so much easier these days because you just Google a problem and you yeah, you can it out. learn how to do anything on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, I didn't go to film school and I didn't need to. I'm sure there's things that that education would have imparted that would have been very helpful for me and would have moved me along the curve. But mm-hmm. certainly, I, you don't you don't need to do that. Yeah. So let's let's maybe fast forward a little bit to return to Mount Kennedy in the sense that. Um, we can talk about how that, how a film kind of comes to be, because first of all, it's just this, there's so much in the film. Like it's such a rich, rich story. I don't even know how, like what's your tagline for the film? I mean, it's cause it's, yeah. it's incredible. I how much is we in can the maybe story. Come up with one today. Cause I'm still. Yeah. We workshop it. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, let's try it. So you've got 1965. Jim Whitaker, renowned American mountaineer, first American to summit Mount Everest is recruited by Bobby Kennedy to climb this mountain in Canada that's named after his brother, John F. Kennedy. Great. You were paying attention, man. Well, yeah, I got to get the dots connected, yeah. right? So so Jim and, and Bobby have this climb. They become fast friends. And and then 50 years later, the sons of those two men decide to uh, go back and try to recreate this climb. Yep. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah, that's fairly accurate. Yeah, I think when I try to explain it these days, I've realized that I'm, it might be the easiest to start with Bob Whitaker. And so I say, you know, this is a film about uh, the black sheep son of a famous mountaineer who for some reason at the age of 48 decides to go recreate this climb that his father did with Robert Kennedy in 1965. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, Bob Whitaker. What a yep. character that guy is. Yep, yep. I mean, your movie starts with this whole vignette of Seattle grunge scene, and then all of a sudden you've got, you know... Eddie Vedder on the camera talking about his experiences with Bob Whitaker. I mean, just, yeah, the richness to the story. So tell us a little bit about how this how this idea kind of came into your mind, something yeah. that would be worth yeah. investigating. Yeah, so I was, you know, in Seattle doing client work in the early 2010s, 2011, um, was approached by Seattle University about making a short piece about Jim Whitaker for okay. an event. Same sort of deal. They had a they had actually an okay budget to to make this short little sure. four minute video. And, and just about some more background on Jim, like Seattle pioneer, well, nationwide pioneer, but also the sort of one of the founders of REI and CEO for many years, and sort of a yeah Seattle institution in many ways. Total icon. I mean, the guy is the guy is as iconic as it gets. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, if mountaineering were more of a popular sport, he would be on the level of like Ali and, you know. Yeah, probably like, yeah, the Jim Brown sort of character yep, of, of absolutely. mountaineering. Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, I was hired to make this this short film for an event they were having to honor the 50th anniversary of the Mount Everest expedition, 1963. Mm-hmm. Um I ended up meeting Jim and his wife that way, and we had a connection that uh, when we we had this meeting in, in uh, early May, and we just so happened to both be going to Mountain Film in Telluride that okay. year. And so they've had like a long relationship with Mountain Film. Mountain Film's kind of like, I mean, I hate to say Burning Man, but it's still got that like sense of community around it. Sure, big film festival in yeah. Telluride, and also travels around. It comes through Missoula. Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, it's 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 very um, very grassroots kind of feeling. Like lots of connections are made out of there. A lot of projects come out of there just because people meet each other. Mm-hmm. So we call it Mountain Magic. Um, so you know, I think because I was going to Mountain Film, there I might have got a little bit of kind of credibility. Yeah, you're so, sort of yeah. in the know. Yeah, it's kind of in, in the in the gang. So they. Um, had a great meeting and they're like, yeah, sure. We'll do some shooting and see what happens. And so we ended up, uh, shooting an interview with Jim and I actually was going to do another project. I read his book like on a plane just so I can get some background and, um, which is an amazing way to get a lot of information. I mean, one of the challenges of being a filmmaker is you're like trying to get as much context as possible so that you can get to a level of depth that you can do something, say something new, right? It's, It's one of the challenging things about it. So when you got a book you can read, it's very helpful to get up to speed. So um, I felt like a new gym after I read that book. So did the interview with him at his house. And I mean, we spent like a half day with him, shot a little footage and then ended up making this film called A Life Well Lived. And it was, a, uh, I think it was probably about four minutes long, mm-hmm. ended up um, being like a lot better than this happens sometimes. Like you just go into a project, you're not sure what it's going to be and ends up being maybe better than you thought it was going to be. And then Seattle University was cool with me changing one little thing about it, basically taking out the part about SU 
and then putting it on the internet on my own. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's you can get it on your website. It's beautiful. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll, it's up we'll there. We'll post a link to it. Sweet, awesome. Um, but it went it went viral and uh, you know was picked up by Atlantic Monthly. Posted it, did a little thing on it. Um, Vimeo gave it a staff pick, and that's like Big call deal. that the, yeah, it's like the hipster Oscars, you know. But they <laughs> they give out like sixteen of them a day probably at this point. But still, it's uh it's a great thing to have, and it means a lot of people see it. Um, so that one went pretty viral and then ended up playing at festivals all around the world, played a mountain film the next year. Um, but what really happened is that Bob Whitaker saw it, okay, Jim's son, and then sent me an email that said basically, Hey, I really appreciated that film that you made about my dad. Like it was way more sweet than other things I've seen about him. Hmm. Bob is like, Bob's a very emotional guy. Um, he, he rejects a lot of the like kind of type A, hardcore, peak bagging alpinism that right. he grew up with, with his father, you know? Uh-huh. And then in the film, he seemed, it seemed like there had been some bumps in the road in his relationship with his father. Like, like To put it lightly. Yeah. yeah. Like, I didn't want to use the term estranged. Because yeah, they're not, no, they're not estranged. Yeah. But, but to, to hear from you that Bob saw the film and reached out to you because he was moved by the, the depiction of his father says something about the complexity of that relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And actually, I'd never really thought of it like that. Yeah, it seemed like from day one that this whole thing got started, it was maybe with Bob's desire in the back of his head to know his father a little bit better. Right, right. I think so, yeah. Whether that was conscious or subconscious, right? Probably subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we ended up becoming buddies. He invited me out to his... We hadn't met at this point, but he invited me out to his off-the-grid cabin out in Ferry County and... You know, that was like the second email I got from Eastern them. Washington. Yeah, deep, east of the Cascades. deep Eastern Washington. Might yeah. as well be another state. Um, so yeah, he invited me out to this cabin and a little creepy, but you know, ended up going a few months later <laughs> with some buddies, had backup. You brought some, yeah, yeah. Some, some body men. Yeah, we did have a firearm too, I believe. Oh, geez. Um, just a twenty-two to shoot cans with, really. Sure. You know? um, so ended up going out to Ferry County, kind of getting to, kind of getting to know who Bob was a little bit better just from seeing that place. But he, had, at that point was kind of ungoogleable and like all of his photos that were associated with him with were like super weird. So it's just hard to get a read on who this guy was. But right? you could tell he had this, this background of in the music industry. Yeah. Cause he had sent me some emails, you know, like, Hey, just a little bit of who I am. Um, currently on tour with the yeah, yeah, yeahs. I was a road manager for REM for 10 years. Yeah. I mean, he seemed like the guy who these bands hired to just, make stuff go yeah. and also make stuff crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think I think that that absolutely back in the 90s, you know, he was completely hired to make things crazy and entertaining. Yeah. And then as you get into these higher level rock acts, you kind of like got to make be sure a little they're professional. Yeah, the buses are on time. Like REM, those guys are pros. Like yeah. they, they they had a pretty yeah. solid operation. Absolutely. Yeah. A New Angle is underwritten by First Security Bank and Blackfoot Communications, two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. This is John Twiggs with Montana PBS, and you're listening to A New Angle. Um, so, yeah, I kind of learned a bit about who Bob was. But still, you know, he's it's confusing to me because he's the son of this famous mountaineer, so I assume that he would be in the mountains and all of these things and kind of quickly learned that that's, that wasn't who he was. Um, they were showing a life well lived at a film festival in Seattle. I invited him out and he came uh, and we met in person and just kind of became buddies. You know, I immediately saw just how funny he was. He's just hilarious at all times. Yeah. Like everybody, he's just like, he's just a clown. Life of the party. Yeah. He's the life of the party. And I don't mean clown in a bad way. I mean, he's just, he's yeah. so hilarious. So um, we became buddies and at some point, in conversation, this whole idea of Mount Kennedy came up. You know, that was 2013, 2014. Okay, and coming from Bob. Like, he had this idea. Yeah, it wasn't for me. Oh, okay. I mean, I knew a little, bit about, a little bit about the Kennedy climb and talking with Jim about it and, and reading the book, but I didn't really understand much of what it was and the significance of, of, of all the history to it. So Bob, at one point, emailed me, um, you know, at like 8 o'clock at night, on a Thursday, I went back and found this and said, hey, do you want to go climb Mount Kennedy, basically? And I'm sure I was three beers deep at that point, and I was like, yep, I'm in. That sounds good. Yeah, why not? Where's that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how um, how that all came together. I think that there was some conversation happening with Bob and his brother, Leaf, 
uh, and I think with Gem 2, about the 50th anniversary. Okay. Let's do something. So, yeah, I think they wanted to do something okay. about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so from there, it goes to Recruiting Leaf, who's, you know, he's much younger than Bob, another son of, of Jim Whitaker's, kind of the prototypical son you would expect of a guy like Jim Whitaker. Like, yeah, I mean, he's yes. Successful and, mountaineer in his yeah, own right, sort of yeah. looks the part. Yes and no. I think, I think Leaf, do, I mean, Leaf is a very different person than Jim. Yeah. I'll say that first off. They're, they're very different human beings. And um, there was by no means any pressure on Leaf to go accomplish the things that he accomplished in the mountains. He is in his own, in his own right. I mean, he's done Mount Everest twice now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've obviously climbed with him, so I see what a beast he is. So yeah. I think, you know, sometimes people that are the, the um, children of, of people that high profile don't want anything to do with it, similar to Bob. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if, yeah, he's maybe not the prototypical, but he has inherited the traits of his father okay. physically. That's and, probably yeah, a better way yeah, of putting yeah. it. Yeah. And so at this point, like you got to recruit a Kennedy. How's that happen? Yeah, we just throw a dart, <laughs> see which one we hit on the board. No, well, you probably want to limit yourself to the, the, yeah. the immediate offspring of, of Bobby. That's yeah, probably first yeah. place to start. Absolutely. So you land on Chris. How does this happen? Well, I think we had reached out to, um, we reached out to Robert Kennedy, I think. And How then, do you even do that? Like, okay, we got to find a Kennedy. Well, like, because there are family connections that have maintained oh, through the winter, for 50 there years. Yeah. Okay, okay, there's your in. So you get you get Robert Kennedy's email and you email him. And yeah. um, I actually don't know. I, I wasn't CC'd on those, so I don't know what those conversations <laughs> were like. Um, but I, I feel like maybe Robert Kennedy wasn't available. Um, and then Chris responded to us. And uh, for some reason was down to do it yeah to his credit really i mean hey let's go climb a mountain with a team of people that barely know what they're doing and you you have this archival footage in your film of you know the original expedition and it's just amazing to like it seems like quite literally bobby kennedy just decided to do this went directly from his job as a senator to you know, the middle of nowhere, Yukon, climbed a mountain, then went straight back, put the suit back on. Yeah. But was a beast on the climb. Yeah. Pretty incredible feat, honestly. Yeah. I mean, he did it, they did it round tripped it in Boston from in like three or four days or something too. Crazy. Is, yeah. Totally insane. I mean, there's some things I will say, like they lucked out on the weather. Well, if they wouldn't sure. have that window, there's no way they would have done it. But yeah, I mean, the guy had no experience in mountaineering at all. Um, and this was back then when you couldn't just Google it and figure some stuff out. Yeah, the equipment wasn't nearly what it is today. Yeah, man, yeah. they're like wearing burlap. I mean, it's yeah. totally, it's totally different. Um, and yeah, his his quote that he has in the in the film is that uh, he trained for Mount Kennedy by walking up and down the stairs and yelling, hollering, "Help!" I guess. Right? Hollering, yeah, help yeah. Me. And that's probably quite literally true. Yeah. 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 So anyway, the, these you you recruit this band of of brothers and sons and and put it together to. Uh, to recreate this climb and you guys are in it. You go into the Yukon and, and figure it out. I mean, how, how sort of, how solid a planned expedition was this? Yeah, sure. Um, well, so first off, we didn't know we were going to make a full film about it. Okay. Um, Bob is like an amazing hustler and he, he realized early on, I think that if he brought me into the project, then I would at least make a video about it. Sure. And that is something we could maybe monetize through sponsorship. Hustle up some sponsors. Yeah. And that totally worked. So we didn't know what it was and we got, uh, you know, Timex expedition, Rainier beer, Mm -hmm. um, sub pop records, all these people that, um, gave us some funding um, and some gear, Feathered Friends, Patagonia. Yeah, I mean, because this is a big deal to yeah. like go. It's it's not it's a non-trivial investment. To, yeah, to I mean, do an expedition like this. We're, we were looking at five grand a piece, and well, not leave because he's got all the stuff um, well worn. <laughs> Whereas ours sure. is brand new. Yeah, 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 five grand a piece probably just to get the sleeping bags and you know the boots and everything. So all of it. Yeah, not and, to mention the guides and the travel. And, sure, and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Not not cheap to go to Alaska and then fly in a helicopter <laughs> to a glacier. <laughs> Sure, no. You know what I mean? Like, definitely not cheap. So um, we were really lucky that uh, that we were able to line that stuff up because it was cost intensive. Mm-hmm. And, and those are really the two the two broad categories of expense for the film were the expedition and the 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 kind of music and art slash archival footage that we used for the film. Yeah, although let's not discount the value of the immense amount of time sure. that you had to put into yeah. it because so much of the film is archival footage. 
And I think you know, your your partner Andy said it took like you had like forty hours of this Bob Whitaker highlight reel to yeah. go through. To yeah, put and that in stuff didn't come till later. Twenty on. minutes into the movie. Yeah, maybe if even if that. Yeah, yeah but still, like the amount of so. I mean, you're not getting paid to do any of that. No, gosh, the promise no. of future payment is, no, no, no. is happening. Is, but Yeah, is it? It's doc film. You never know. Well, so that's another question. I mean, I think we've sort of told listeners enough to entice them into the film. It's sure. such an awesome film. Go see it or find a way to see it. And let's talk about that. Like, what, how, You're here for a film festival. You're probably going to have a couple other screenings or try to plan screenings to the extent you can. But like, what is the process of like trying to... I don't want to say monetize, but yeah. get this piece of content in front of more people. Like how yeah. do you get something on Netflix or Hulu or sure. Amazon or whatever? Yeah. Oh, wait, you don't know? I thought. I thought oh, yeah. Someone. Yeah. Marketing professor. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Oh, uh, geez. Um, you got to go on Joe Rogan's podcast. I know. And then that, that's how it happens. Joe, if you're listening, it's yeah. Becker at <laughs> gmail.com. Hit me up. Yeah, exactly. No. Your phone's um, blowing up. Oh, geez. How did he know? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take like a little bit of a step back that. Obviously, I did not do this for money. Um, True. Uh, I also didn't do it to go into crazy debt. But, um, y- you know, because, like I said, that starting early on in my career, I put the focus on trying to understand how to do everything. Mm-hmm. I kind of did everything on this film. Not to take away the incredible amount of work that Andrew Frank's editor put into this with me. And this is your first full feature. Yeah, first full feature. 72 film. minutes. I mean, it's. Yeah, 80 actually. Yeah. 80 minutes. 80 okay. Minutes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, first full feature. So definitely a big undertaking. And four years, I think, really, because we had started talking about it in 2014 and yeah. we didn't finish it until 2018. The climb so. was in 15. Yeah. And it, you released last year. Yeah. At, uh, and we're still, I mean, you know, we're like not done working on it. Sure. Air quotes. Um, the, the work still goes on of trying to get it out there. So what does it look like to get it out there? Uh, you know, one other kind of bit of context is that like I work as a professional director for doing sponsored content, you know, the commercials, corporate, whatever. Like uh-huh. I have to pay the bills. I have a two-year-old. I have a mortgage. So uh, largely I find that um, that the work that I have to do on Mount Kennedy is sort of in the off hours, right? Maybe I can steal a day here and there to kind of hustle on it. Sure. Well, you're here for the film festival, and you've only been to one film, your own. That's true, And you probably didn't didn't, watch the whole thing. I didn't go to it at all, actually. Oh, really? Just showed up for the end? Yeah, we went and had dinner, and then, yeah. um, Yeah, just showed up for the Q&A. Yeah, so I'm basically working all the time and trying to figure out when I can put the work into this one. Um, And then, you know, I the last push that we did was in starting, like, in December of 20... I guess. Oh, maybe it was like October of 2017 where mm-hmm. I really kind of pushed work off and got stuff kind of on autopilot with other people helping me and then really did this massive push up into finishing it in May to where we were just kind of working on the edit every day long. Just I would wake up at like 3 a.m. and go into my garage where I was working and just like hammer away at it till right. like 11 at night. Oof. You know, we had a baby at that point. I have lots of photos of me with, with Shelby strapped to my chest oh, geez. while I'm editing. And so it was a lot to do kind of at once. Um, and you could, I mean, there's nothing to stop you from just sticking it on Vimeo and having an access fee or, or putting it on iTunes and charging a fee. I don't know if yeah. iTunes necessarily works that way, but that's not necessarily the best path, right? Yeah, it, it's probably not the best path. Um, at the end of the day, films do well when people know about them. Yeah. And you can do that yourself, or you can associate with a large company that can do that for you. Right. For a piece, obviously, of the action. Um, and so you get, you know, it's like, I've also heard if you want to self publish your book, you can do it, but it might not be as good for your second book. Right. Yep. Once you go down that route, it might be hard to get out of it. So, um, we know that there is a market for this film and the response we see from audiences, like we saw last night here is just like overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. I mean, people laugh and they cry and there's a line of people afterwards that come up and say how amazing it was and tell us a story about Bobby Kennedy and you know, say they want their friends to see it. Like that happens every time we show the film. I get emails every day from people saying, when is this gonna be out? Like we know there's a demand for it, right? But the tricky thing for us is that, back to the conversation we were just having 20 minutes ago, like what's the log line for a complex story like this? Yeah. And I don't yeah. mean to sound like I'm shirking responsibility because at the end of the day, that's on me to figure that stuff out, sure. you know? But um, it's a really complicated film and it's complicated just to fit it into a nice kind of through line of what it is. Yeah. I got to think deeply about what the log line is. 
Yeah. We're not going to workshop it on this pod. No, let's but, not do it. Yeah. But uh, four hours long. If that, yeah. yeah. It, it, that's a hugely interesting challenge. I wish I could provide some insights. On no, no, that. I don't. I don't expect. That. I'm not going to hold you to that. But, um, but yeah, no. So we we have a sales agent that has been talking with distributors sure. about about uh, potential sales, and um, that's a whole other thing. I mean, that's like a you know when you have an agent, it's an art in of itself. And, oh yeah, another person taking a piece, but yeah, also yeah, yeah get you yeah. in front of more people and more contacts. Sure. Um, so I mean, where we are right now financially, I put in. Um, you know, probably 20 grand of my own money just to, mm-hmm. to make sure we could get it to the finishing line um, and cover a lot of the licensing fees for music and stuff. We owe, you know, we owe like a low five figures probably at this point debt wise on the film, which mm-hmm. is not bad. I mean, some people come out of a dock and they got six figure debt on it. Sure. I mean, I didn't, I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, so we found that we can just set up screenings and, and monetize it that way and okay. then slowly pay off the people that we owe the money. And most people have been cool because they know that we're good for it. Yeah. So it's not, you know, it just means the legwork of, um, of getting the film out there, you know, reaching out to theaters, signing contracts with them, doing the PR around it. But we found it to be very, like, very successful model, um, time intensive in some ways if you do it at scale, but a successful model to, to, to generate revenue. Um, you know, we can make three thousand dollars a night on a screening if we can get enough people in the seats, mm-hmm. and you know, it's maybe a couple of days of work to to get that to, to happen. Do that. And those are also those successful screenings are also great proof of concept. Yeah, to use to sell the film. As and well. not only that, you you know, with all these things, um, you know, we're in an era of of the followership being key mm-hmm. to monetize anything you do uh, to a fault in a lot of ways. Yeah you know, network is king. Like you need that social network to be able to convince people that it's going to be a worthwhile investment, whatever you're doing. You know, Mm -hmm. the photographers that I know that have a million followers just get more work. You know, it's just how it works these days. So, um, we, we slowly are building that network of people as we take the film out and, you know, get people to vouch for it and tell other people it's worth seeing. Let's circle back to you know, a theme you spoke about earlier and, you know, your, your public health led you to have an awareness of important social, social issues. And you made a comment after the screening last night that really resonated with me. And, and part of it was just seeing a lot of that archival footage of, of, of Bobby Kennedy and, and his relationship with Jim Winokur and how people responded to the Kennedy assassination, Bobby Kennedy's assassination. And you made a comment about civil discourse and how this film is maybe... Uh, made you think and reflect on on the tenor of politics in our current time. I don't want to get too political necessarily, sure, but sure. like, you know, how is that this particular story? How is that sort of struck some of those internal value chords that you were yeah. you've been trying to get to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this piece is an extension of all the work I've done before and yeah. trying to be values driven. Um, but at the same time, like. I understand you got to tell a good story and you don't want it to be a bummer. Mm-hmm. So hence the, the, the laughs, you know, the yeah. like energy, the rock and roll. Sure. All the Bob Whitaker outtake yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. I think first and foremost, the responsibility of a documentary filmmaker is to um, tell something compelling, tell mm-hmm. a compelling story. Um, you, you have a responsibility to the audience whose time you're going to take to make something that is enjoyable. Now that's not to say that there isn't, plenty of um, validity in telling an important story that's hard to watch, right? Like those docs are, they help move the needle on social justice issues and they're they're compelling in their own right. Um, but for me, the first thing was to make it kind of fun and enjoyable. And, um, and actually I got comments from multiple people last night that were like, you know, we see a lot of documentaries that are bummers and it was nice to be at a doc fest where we, we were like laugh and cry and have a good time. And the range of emotion was, yeah, was a really, was yeah, really powerful. Yeah. And I think, um, at the end of the day, I'm going to tie all this together here at the end of the day, as a filmmaker, uh, the only thing you have is emotion. It's with any creative art that you're doing. Like mm-hmm. you're relying on human emotions and trying to evoke a response in people, right? Like you want it to be evocative so that it is compelling. Cause when you can engage people's hearts, you can engage their minds more effectively and, um, that's always been really important to me is, and that's what kind of where the, that's the intersection of, uh, that meets, I guess where craft exists, right? Like, sure. like how do you use music and use narrative and use characters and use the visual imagery to create that sort of, you know, that mix of things that will evoke those emotions and lead people to some sort of conclusion. Right. So 
that was that's all very important stuff to me. And then what I find is that I'm following my own emotion in the process of making it. So if I'm crying because Bobby Kennedy's speaking and I've got the music right in that moment and I'm sitting there on my own alone in my garage editing the thing and just bawling, then I'm pretty sure someone else is going to feel that too. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I like to follow that thread of emotion. And it just so happens that I get really emotional about issues of human rights and social justice. I mm-hmm. get emotional about when people who don't need to be fighting for the underdog are fighting for the underdog, right? And that was Bobby Kennedy. Um, And so part of that was his just level of dialogue surrounding human rights and kindness and justice and uh, fighting for those in society who don't have an advocate, you know, doing that in the 60s when it was even more contentious maybe than it is today to have those opinions. So. When you make a film, you go so deep into uh, the characters in the sense that you're just surrounded by the footage constantly. You're learning about it as much as you can. So um, it was very inspiring for me to be so enshrouded in the message of who Bobby Kennedy was and what he stood for. Mm -hmm. It makes me kind of think about what's next for you. I mean, you said you're working on another film right now and, and... You've had some conversations here in, in Montana. I think you went over to Butte to look at some, yeah, some well, scenery over there. Yeah, and like, what I'm are you always, cooking up next? I'm always doing corporate uh, kind of sponsored content work. We sure. make videos about cameras right now for camera brands. Yep. It's a cool gig. We basically get to travel the world and um, you know, kind of do what we want uh, to a certain extent. We have we have masters, but they're and, really cool. And you get access to great cameras. Sure, which, yeah, yeah. Know, for a filmmaker, it's probably yeah. a nice thing. Yeah, so it's, it's a far cry from me going to Yale University just so I could buy a laptop, you know? Yeah, yeah like there you now, go. Yeah, now Same actually, model, though. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> now I actually get this stuff for free sometimes. But um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I do, I have my own kind of like day job thing where I'm constantly making short pieces to, you know, for whatever. And um, sometimes the pieces are a minute and a half. Sometimes they're 10 minutes long. They're more story-based. Um, uh-huh. So that's great. Uh, for my own personal work, I just finished a short piece on the photographer who was on the Mount Kennedy climb, a guy named D. Molinar. Okay. So he's like a legend in the Seattle kind of mountaineering world. He was uh-huh. a ranger on Rainier. He's climbed Rainier 50 times. He wrote the book, The Challenger Rainier. You've okay. probably seen it before. Yeah, like, the name's familiar. Yeah, yeah, he's one of those guys, but he, he's just uh, he's just like an amazing Renaissance man. He turned 100 years old in June, and wow. we took him up to paradise on Mount Rainier on his 100th birthday to like have him see the mountain. Sure. So that was a really cool little film. And honestly, that one, that one was where I took all the stuff that I learned from making Mount Kennedy, mm. all the mistakes I've made. Right, right, right. And I was like, all right, let's get ahead of these things and um, do something, you know, think it through beforehand, know what the pitfalls could be, figure out how to avoid them to make this piece. And I think, I think it's super lovely. It's like around 14 minutes long and we haven't released it yet. We're trying to figure out what we want to do. So Actually, like not drop one of your main characters into a crevasse. Yeah, yeah. Although I mean, that, that makes for great film. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that does, that does help. Yeah. So I'm working on that. Um, and then, you know, like I said, the work continues with Mount Kennedy to find the distributor and uh, dig ourselves out of the hole. And, you know, like when you make something like this at this scale, you want as many people to see it as possible. Right. Like you got to just do the hustle. So, so yeah, that's, that's the, the other thing I got going on. Nice. Well, hopefully you'll be back soon and have another screening of something else yeah. at the Big Sky Documentary Film Fest at some point. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just, Eric, always a pleasure to connect with you. Uh, we, we, I feel like we have these sort of intense connections with lots of time in between. And yeah. I appreciate you stopping by, sharing right on, your man. wisdom and, and bringing your wonderful film to our community. Yeah, I'm stoked to be a listener to your podcast now. This is, it's fun to hear you talk to these people. And it was great to hear uh, you be interviewed. I learned stuff about you that I had no idea about. I didn't know you were at Yale. Yeah, yeah, for a little bit. What, yeah. what year was that? Uh, it was there like 2002 and three. Okay, so that was before my time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm really old. Well, you're, you're maybe a little bit older than me. Uh, yeah. Well, next I, podcast. We'll talk about it. it. There we go. All right. All right, Eric. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Eric. Check out his film, Return to Mount Kennedy. You will be glad you did. Okay. Next week, we have Peter Giannascoli, the co-president of domestic marketing at Paramount Pictures. That sounds like an important job. It sounds like a cool job. I'm excited for you to learn all about it next week. Thanks for listening to New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, part of the Michelle and Lauren Hansen Media Lab at the University of Montana College of Business. Remember that this podcast was supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. 
These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you'd ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps. Executive producer, Stefan Borsum. Producer, Aidan Morton. And interns, Aspen Runkel, Max Gibson, and Ellie Hanasek. Huge thanks to VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks for the tunes. And finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at a new angle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word and be sure to use the hashtag a new angle when you do. Thanks a lot. See you next time. <laughs>